Good morning, and welcome to the Virginia Festival of the Book at Monticello. My name is John Ragasta. I'm a historian here at the International Center for Jefferson Studies, and I'm so pleased this morning to be here with Lindsay Stravinsky to talk about her book, The Cabinet. But before we get to that, a uh, little business to take care of. Uh, first of all, the Virginia Festival of the Book is a program of Virginia Humanities, a statewide organization which, whose mission is to connect people and ideas to explore the human experience. Please make sure you've silenced your cell phone. Uh, we encourage you to be aware there are exits in case of an emergency. Uh, there is a bookseller on site over in our shop, and after we're done, I'm sure Lindsay would be more than happy to sign a book and have a chat with you there. I will be taking her away immediately after the questions and answers to, to do a book signing. We'd also like to give a special thank you today to our Virginia Festival of the Book premier sponsor, Michelle and David Baldacci. Uh, many Festival of the Book events, this one included, are free of charge, but they are not free to produce. And we do hope you'll take the opportunity. There's a lot of QR codes around, or if you want to go to vabook.org, uh, a contribution is most welcome. We also need your input, and I was told yesterday there are little surveys, which I believe you will be getting as we go into the question and answer uh, program. Um, those are very, very important to Virginia Humanities, but also they use them for grant applications. So we really hope you'll take the opportunity to fill those out. Uh, remember, the festival's authors and speakers are speaking on their own behalf. They do not speak for Virginia Humanities, uh, but I am delighted today to have the chance to be here with Lindsay Tervinsky. So let me turn to today's program. Uh, Lindsay, if you don't know her, is a presidential historian. She's an award-winning author of the book we're talking about today, The Cabinet, George Washington and Creation of an American Institution. Institution. <laughs> she is the co-editor of Morning the President, and she has coming out August or September? September 5th. September 5th uh, her new book, John Adams and the uh, Presidents that Forged the Republic. Uh, she is a regular writer and commentator at Wall Street Journal, CNN, Washington Post, Time Magazine. You, I'm certain you've seen Lindsay in some of these fora. Um, but today, uh, it's my opportunity, we're not, we want to talk about this book, but before we get to the book and the historic content, uh, Virginia Festival the Book, we have a lot of book lovers here. This is your first book. What was the most interesting, concerning, disturbing aspect of just getting the book produced and into print? Oh, it's a really good question. So um, the thing about writing a book is that there's not really a way to teach anyone to write a book until you actually write the book. Because if you were to ask 100 authors how to do it, you'd probably get 105 answers. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's really no teaching, there's no teaching instruction that compares to the experience of actually doing it. And so one of the things that I found to be uh, most challenging in my process was trying to figure out how to lay out the story. It is obviously called the cabinet, and yet because it's so, it was so important to me to talk about Washington's revolutionary leadership and how that shaped his ideas about what it meant to consult with people and get input, I needed to have a revolutionary war component. And so I fought against making it chronological initially. Well, for a long time, I, I really fought against it. And I tried all sorts of different organizations. And because I was worried that if you didn't get until the, to the first cabinet meeting until significantly into the book, that that would feel weird. Um, and it turns out that most of the time chronological is just the answer. So I ended up having to rewrite it like four times because I pull, had to pull apart every sentence to you know try and put it back together in a new way. And finally, I said, all right, we're just, we're going in order, and usually that is the way to go with books, if you could help it. Uh, Lindsay, for a historian, the stream of time is so hard to avoid. It's it really so is. powerful. Well, but that leads me then maybe to the first substantive question. Um, one of the things that was interesting to me, I've read a lot in this period. I think I've read a lot in this period. And one of the comments you made very early in the first chapter, and it was one of those things I thought, well, I, sh I know this, but it's striking was that when the Founding Fathers gather in Philadelphia, um, or when they gather for the Continental Congress, more of the founders had traveled to London than to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. How does that affect your story? Yeah, this is one of my favorite facts to try and explain to people how much the concept of the United States did not exist, and how most colonists really did see themselves as British first, and then Virginians second, or New Yorkers. So it's the first Continental Congress when they meet in Philadelphia. 
more of the delegates at that Congress had been to London than had been to Philadelphia, which is kind of a bonkers fact, right? Um, and I, I think that that's just so important because when we think about what it means to create a new nation, to create new institutions, to create a presidency, there are no emotional ties you can build on. There isn't really a, a history that you can count on to get you through difficult times. The American people don't have those emotional connections to the institutions that we do today. And that was something that they had to kind of try and figure out how to build and was one of the real challenges, I think, especially of the first presidency, because the president is, of course, the only official that represents all Americans as opposed to a congressperson. I was going to make a joke. I'd rather be here than in Philadelphia, but no, we won't. <laughs> okay, so the, the book actually starts. I mean, that's the first chapter. But the book actually starts in the introduction. August 22nd, 1789, George Washington goes to the Senate for his first chance to take advice and consent. If you're familiar with the, I forgot my pocket constitution today, but the constitution, the president is supposed to seek the advice and consent of the Senate on a number of matters relating to foreign affairs. And George Washington goes in to discuss a Native American treaty. Mm -hmm. And he sits down and he explains the treaty and advice and consent. And there's silence. And, and, and Washington, who's, who, he, he can have a thin skin. Well, in this case, it's not so much thin skin as this is temper. So what's, what's important to note about this incident is that the framers at the Constitutional Convention had put in the advised part quite intentionally. They really genuinely expected the Senate to be a council of foreign affairs, and they talked about it, about this was one of the reasons they weren't going to have a cabinet in the Constitution. They weren't going to have an executive council because the senators would be more experienced, they'd be more responsible, but they would also be accountable to the American people in the state legislature. So if they gave bad advice, then they could be removed. And Washington, of course, was there for all of this. He was the president of the convention. He did not miss a single session. And so that was his expectation. And he went in and he asked them for his advice. And I think what's so important about you know, his personal context was he had come from the army in which when he tells his officers to do something, they did it. And then, you know, he spent the next several years on his plantation where his word really goes. So he gets to Congress and he tells the senators and they, you know, shuffle their papers and they twiddle their thumbs and they avoid eye contact, all strategies we have seen students <laughs> deploy today to try and avoid being called on, but they don't do what he says. And so finally, you know, one, one senator uh, stood up, his name was William McClay, he was a Pennsylvania senator. And he stood up and he said, you know, this is, this is a new issue to us, which by the way, it was not. There had been a lot of planning for this meeting. This was not a surprise. And we would like to refer it to committee. And can you come back next week? And Washington lost it. And he stood up and he yelled, this defeats every purpose of my being here but you know, louder, scarier, he's super tall and big and, and, and like the, the most, general. yeah. And the most famous man in the world at this point, and he's furious with them. And he did finally agree to come back, but on the way out, he reportedly said, and the evidence we have of this is a little bit sketchy of whether or not he actually said it, but he was definitely thinking it. Um, he said that he would never again return to the Senate for advice. And the way that we know he was thinking it is because he never again returned to the Senate for advice. And critically, no president since has ever returned to the Senate for advice. So just what's so important, and the reason I start yes. the book on this, this story is just a couple of months into the presidency, this key element that was laid out in the Constitution to support the executive, Washington has concluded doesn't really work because the senators are annoying and they're inefficient, and he has to think creatively instead about how he's going to get advice. And this is in August of 1789, and he took the oath of office in April. So it's I, what's so important about it is it does show that you know they write the Constitution, so great, you have a plan, and then you actually have to, to do it, yeah. and that starts to change. Right, and, and so for foreign affairs and, and international, suddenly the presidency, it's no longer the presidency in the Senate, it's the presidency. But, and we don't want to dwell on this particular incident because we have a lot of others to discuss, but could it really have gone any different? I mean, could, I mean, if you ever dealt with a collective body. <laughs> well, you know, I think the difference is, so he, and I'm, I apologize if I'm jumping the gun on one of your other questions, but 
So during the war, Washington had worked with what he called councils of war, where he would bring together all of his senior officers and their aides de camp. He would send out a list of questions ahead of time to sort of set the agenda for what he wanted to discuss so they knew about it. They would have sometimes very raucous debates. If we, if you're familiar with the lists of the officers, they were these were not small personalities and not small egos. And so, you know, they had a, they knew what they wanted and they were were used to articulating it. And that form of debate was extraordinarily helpful to him because it was a way to stress test different positions to allow them to poke holes in each other's arguments. And he could kind of sit back and study what was going on. And so I think that when he got to the Senate, he was expecting that to happen. But again, he was not their commander in chief. He was the president. And I, so I think, it was a, I think it was a miscommunication about the difference between the hierarchy of the military and to your point, how legislative bodies work in terms of their own deliberative yeah. nature. And thus the cabinet. And thus the cabinet. Thus cabinet. Okay, trick question. Okay. Sorry, trick question. Do you remember your first footnote? Oh, no. <laughs> I don't what remember. What is my first I, footnote? No, no, no. I'll, I'll tell you what your first footnote <laughs> okay. is. Okay. First footnote um, is uh, Washington writing to John Adams, asking for his advice on forming the government. Love that. And John Adams, I went then and looked up the letters. Yeah. Right at the footnote, and, and John Adams actually sends good advice. Uh -huh. He talks about, okay, we're creating a new government, and how do you do it, and what do you do this, and sends a long letter, which presumably Washington appreciates. Um, but... Nobody cares about the vice president mm. in 1789 or today. Um, and is, is, what, what happens to the vice president? Is it a lost opportunity? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think that a lot of the way that the vice president developed in Washington's administration, partly it can be what they understood the vice president's responsibilities to be to the Senate. The you know, the vice president is the president of the Senate. And today the vice president shows up when there's a vote to be cast. Back then, John Adams sat in on the Senate sessions every day that they were in session. He was there all the time. Most of the time he kept his mouth shut because they had made it very clear after the first couple of months that his input was not welcome um, and kindly told him to shut it. And so he just sat there and was bored out of his mind. So I think partly it was this understanding that the, the vice president genuinely did have a role in the legislative body, but also it was personal. And, and that's what I really love about this period is because these positions are new and there are relatively few people in office and they're kind of trying to figure it out from scratch. The people that are actually holding the positions matter so very much. And John Adams and George Washington had great respect for one another. They had gotten along reasonably well. John Adams had been a little critical of moments of George Washington's military leadership, which Washington <laughs> never forgot, to your point about him <laughs> having the thin skin. Um, but what I think really happened was, because you're right, the initial advice was excellent. It, it was really quite thoughtful. In the summer of 1789, they had to figure out what to call the president. And the one option was His Excellency, which was what usually they called governors and generals, and it was sort of a common honorific. John Adams wanted something more glorious, something like, um, I, can't, I can never remember exactly what it is. It's like his elected majesty and protector of our liberties. Um, <laughs> it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, right? Um, but to be fair to John Adams, he had spent the last decade in London and the Netherlands and France, and he had seen Versailles and the court of St. James and the Hague, and he was worried that ministers would come to the United States and say, what is this podunk backwater with, you know, no government? And he thought that a fancy title might help to cultivate some respect from the American people and from visiting dignitaries. And uh, needless to say, that was not a particularly popular position. And he lost a lot of public credibility. And I think at that point, Washington started to distance himself because he didn't really trust John Adams' political judgment. And therefore, from that point forward, never invited John Adams to a single cabinet meeting did not include him in any major substantive conversations. And so I think that really started to set the tone for what the vice president would be. And that was, I think, then confirmed when John Adams was president, Thomas Jefferson was vice president, 
And he was the leader of the opposing party. So like, of course, he was not going to be in cabinet deliberations. So once you had, I think, 12 years of, did I do my math right? Yes, once you had 12 years of that practice, then it kind of set the tone. Well, well Twy, and I want to pull on the string a little bit about the personalities matter, mm -hmm. 20 years. Because Aaron Burr, well, I guess oh, yeah. uh, mm. 16 years. Aaron Burr is Jefferson's first, and that Very SOB true. almost took the presidency <laughs> from me. Exactly. So, uh, and know, then the, killed the, Hamilton. Uh, uh, yeah. Not that Jefferson. Well, well, that was a good thing. That's true. I was going to say, not that Jefferson minded, but it's not a great look for a vice president. I, well, I've always, I've always thought that Jefferson really likes Hamilton a lot better after he's shot by that <laughs> SOB Burr. Um, that's true. That's my own view. Um, but it's interesting. I mean, the vice presidency. So we have this this administration after administration after administration where the personalities are affecting what could have been. That first letter was so striking to me. Yeah. I had not read that letter because yeah. you know here's the president talking to the vice president about how do we do this? How do we put this government together? But it never happens. Mm -hmm. And it, and then for two hundred years it doesn't happen. Warm bucket of spit. Who was it? Who's that? Uh, Spiro Spiro Agnew. I'm from Texas. He didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on. We don't want to continue that discussion. Okay. Let's talk about George. Okay. Let's, let's talk, talk about, about George. George. Um, Thornton, who is the clerk for Minister Hammond, British mm -hmm. minister, he says that George loved to be treated with great respect in a very kingly style. Mm -hmm. And uh, Washington does the carriage business. He's got the liberty enslaved people. Um, what about George? As as how does he how does he try to model personally this new role? Mm, yeah. Well, I'm really glad that you started with the anecdote about the the visitors to to Philadelphia because it was it was so much more than a lack of uh, emotional connection to the institution. If we think about what Article Two says, it is really short. It's like this big on the paper. And it doesn't say how the president should dress. It doesn't say how the president should talk. It doesn't say how the president should really interact with the other branches of government or how they should host social events or how, I mean, anything that we think of in terms of most of the president's activities today, the Constitution does not touch. And so, and I think partly that's because they understood that sometimes you don't want to write everything down. You do want to leave some flexibility for circumstances to change. Partly it was because by the time they got to figuring out the details of the presidency, it was August in Philadelphia and they were hot and grouchy and tired and they wanted to go home and they were done with it. And then the third piece is Washington was sitting in the room and everyone knew that if the constitution was ratified, he was gonna be the first president. There was zero surprise in that election. And it must have been really awkward to be talking about what the president should or should not do when this guy is sitting there staring at you. Um, and so I think they, and he had demonstrated that he could be trusted with enormous authority and enormous power. And so they kind of just trusted him to figure it out. So he comes into office. The letter that he sends to John Adams is actually mostly concerned with a lot of these social elements. Can I, can I have friends over? Can I go to their house? Can I, you know, should I regularly open the doors to citizens? Should, you know, what sort of social interactions am I supposed to be doing? And so he comes up with a series of compromises where he's trying to do sort of one thing that will instill respect in the office and demonstrate sort of a kingly attitude without actually being a king. And one thing to demonstrate that he's still just a small R Republican. And this is everything from how he dresses so for his inauguration, he ordered a very nice homespun suit from Philadelphia. So he was the first president to wear American made to the, his inauguration, but he liked nice things. So he also had diamond shoe buckles. He would, he had the fanciest carriage in all of North America. Everyone knew what, who, who was, who was in that carriage. It was cream colored with gold trim. As John said, he had uh, I think he had six matching horses and then the enslaved uh, valets that basically tended to the carriage had matching uniforms. Does anyone have a white car? Show of hands, yes. And what happens when it rains and you have a white car? Yes, it gets disgusting, right? And that's with running water and pavement. So if you have a cream colored carriage, that is a signal that you have enough wealth to either pay for or to own labor that can clean it by hand every single time you take it out. So it was a very intentional signal. And yet 
every day. He would walk out of the president's house in Philadelphia, walk to the town square, and adjust his watch while looking at the um, clock surface in the or clock tower in the square. Did he have to do that? No, he could have obviously adjusted his watch in other fashions. But it was a symbol that he can walk on the streets and his boots will get muddy just like anyone else's. And that might not be a symbol that we necessarily pick up on today, but his contemporaries knew exactly what he was doing and they talked about it. And so it, I love those details because it just demonstrates how thoughtful he was about trying to strike the right balance in every element of the presidency. And it also, I think, goes to explain why he wrote to Henry Knox on his way to his inauguration, why he was feeling like a prisoner going to the place of execution, which is not the sentiment you usually associate with an inauguration. But there was just so much pressure on every single decision, and he felt the weight of it constantly. Well, you, you mentioned in the book Washington's emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. using a modern term, but I spend my time with Jefferson, Patrick Henry. Washington really is the essential man in in multiple respects, in the war, in the presidency. Um, one aspect, I want to dig a little deeper into the emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. because we were talking about personalities vis-a-vis -vis the vice president. What about Washington and women? Mm -hmm. with, with noting John Adams isn't so good with women, Thomas Jefferson has women issues, I'm going to push Washington... back on that, but go ahead. Okay, continue. okay, okay. Well, Abigail is okay. But does, does Washington's um, treatment and role with women affect his presidency? Or how does it affect yeah, his presidency? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. So on one hand, Washington had a number of very close female relationships with, with, with whom he felt, I think, that he could be a little bit more emotionally open the, there's a book called Founding Friendships by Cassandra Good that talks about the sort of decorum of, of friendship and letter writing at the time. And so sometimes we see letters and we think, oh, that's quite scandalous. But actually, it was just really how people talk to each other. And so I think that he felt that he could be more openly uh, emotional with some of those friends. And especially there are a couple of women in Philadelphia who were among the most esteemed hostesses of the time. And they held sort of these rotating salons, you know, like Martha Washington had Fridays and another woman had Tuesdays, another woman had Wednesdays. Um, and, and, and those social scenes were technically private events because women were present, meaning they were not political, which is of course a very good joke because of course they were political. Um, and, you know, because women were present, politics was not discussed. It was extraordinarily political. And, and these scenes were, were really essential because it was where the networking took place. It was where the negotiations of positions and relationships and alliances and marriages and all of these things that, were, that really made up the web of the Philadelphia government life. Um, but when we think of his wife, we, it tended to be a more traditional relationship. So I, all evidence suggests that he and Martha were really quite close. They had a very affectionate relationship. I say all evidence suggests because we only have, I think, two letters remaining between them because uh, he asked her to burn their correspondence when he died, and she did so. So we don't really know what they talked about, which as a historian, oh, I just... I know all of the good stuff was in those letters, all of the snark, all of the gossip, all of the, you know, personal vendettas, which is, of course, why they were burned. Um, but he desperately wanted her around. He wanted her there every winter in the war to be around at winter quarters. Her presence was really important to him and very comforting to him. He wanted her in the president's house when he was was president. And so I don't think that she was necessarily an advisor. I don't know that they necessarily talked about policy. There's no evidence one way or the other. In her other letters, she does not really discuss politics in the same way that Abigail Adams does. So that leads me to believe that she took less of a role in the discussion and the formulation of policy. But there's no doubt that they were close and they valued each other's company. Um, Contrasting that, John Adams uh, had the most remarkable wife uh, in the 18th century. You know, she's, of course, known for her remember the ladies statement. But I think that when you go through her correspondence, that ends up being one of the least remarkable things she said because she was such an astute political 
observer. She was so savvy and so canny about understanding people's motivations. And people often criticize John for having a cabinet of one, and it's perhaps the most accurate criticism uh, that they could levy. So that is a much more what we think of as a modern political relationship. I think George and Martha had a much more traditional one, but that's not to say that it didn't matter to him. Well, it obviously mattered. And you, you mentioned the salons, and I think it was the Neutrality Proclamation where Washington's at one of these private salons and pulls a senator oh, aside. Oh, that was earlier. Yeah, and... so Martha hosted, her drawing rooms were on Friday afternoons, and it, they were open to women and men of sort of good standing. She served lemonade and tea. There was no alcohol or gambling allowed. Um, and what was important is because she was the host, Washington was there as a private citizen, which is obviously not really a distinction we would draw, but it was a social distinction they drew. And because he was there as a private citizen and not there as the president, he could go up and talk to congressmen about politics and it didn't appear to be inappropriate interference in congressional matters. So early on in 1790, when Congress is trying to figure out how much money to allocate to foreign ministers, like how, 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 how much are we gonna give to this? And Washington was pushing for a bigger sum because he wanted the ability to appoint more ministers across the globe. And if they gave him a small sum, then it was gonna limit the number of people he could send and where. And so he goes up to, to Congress, to a Senator who's in the room and he says, you know, I'd really like you to push for a higher number. And a couple of days later, sure, sure enough, the senators push for a higher number, they get it passed. And he allows himself a little bit of gloating in his diary that they did in fact pass the bill with the higher number that he requested. So he was, he was meddling. He was definitely meddling, but he was doing it in a way that was appropriate yeah. for the time. No, he's, he's, he's pretty good at it. Well, um, switch gears a little bit. Ever since Lin-Manuel Miranda write, wrote that, that play, mm -hmm. um, we have to talk about the guy from New York. We do. Uh, we have to talk about Mr. Hamilton and Mr. Jefferson, who, um, everybody's familiar, they clash mm -hmm. on occasion. How does their relationship build not only Washington's cabinet, but our understanding of the cabinet? Mm -hmm. is, is it a good example? Is it a bad example? Is it indicative? Yeah. So. Hamilton and Jefferson come into the administration. They already know each other, but not particularly well. They respect one another. But from the very beginning, they agree on almost nothing. They just have very different life experiences in terms of where they've come from. They're sort of diametrically opposed in their, in their experience, but they also have diametrically opposed worldviews. So Jefferson is mo more pro-French. Hamilton is more pro-British. Hamilton is very interested in supporting trade and industry and development in um, in sort of rudimentary technology. And Jefferson is very pro-farming and agriculture. I mean, like you name it, they pretty much disagreed on the subject, which is fine. And Washington, I think, was quite intentional about trying to bring in multiple perspectives. He genuinely wanted those differing views in his cabinet and told them as much regularly. But the problem was Washington's first cabinet meeting didn't occur until November 26th, 1791 which was two and a half years into his administration. And they had had some conflicts before then. Um, they had, you know, had conversations that were tense. They had exchanged letters that were tense. But once they started meeting regularly, if you've ever been in a meeting with someone that you don't particularly like, the more you have to see them, the more you start to dislike them. And I think that they began to view the other as a mortal threat to the nation, to their vision of what the nation should be. And so the cabinet, because especially by 1793, when the neutrality crisis happened, when the neutrality crisis happened, when France declared war on Great Britain and the United States was trying to stay out of it, they were meeting up to five times per week, sometimes several hours per day in Washington's private study, which was about 15 by 21 feet wide and was stuffed with furniture. So there was very little personal space in the summer in Philadelphia with no air conditioning. And so you can imagine that you're stuck with someone you don't, you, you can't stand. They drive you crazy for hours a day in this space, no personal space whatsoever. And it starts to serve as a hothouse for political tensions. And so I firmly believe that political parties would have emerged eventually anyway, 
but I think their being locked in this room made it happen faster and more intensely because they felt motivated to do something about it. Now, in terms of how that affected the cabinet and whether or not it was a good or bad example, it all depends on whether or not they're willing to stick it out. So during the councils of war and the revolution, Washington's officers regularly disagreed on things. But I think because they had a common enemy, they were kind of willing to put that aside sometimes towards the end and accept his final decision and move forward. Washington was also quite intentional about trying to cultivate an esprit de corps among his officers and, and sort of build that family bond to get through difficult disagreements. And he really genuinely tried to do the same thing in the cabinet. He had them over to what he called his family dinners. And this was his official family. If a meeting was particularly tense, he would call, he would call a timeout and they would go have a meal together. He constantly was telling the other one that you know, they were both patriots. He valued their input. He begged Jefferson to stay in the cabinet for years. And in fact, got him basically to extend his term by almost two additional years just by pleading with him and flattering him in any number of sort of emotional manipulations you can think of. Um, and I think that if Jefferson had been willing to continue to stick that out, Washington would have put up with this disagreement because he found it to be useful. Yeah, that, that's the story. Not only put up with, I mean, Washington yeah, seems to want this. He's trying to figure out what to do. And he yeah. Very different from the way we think of cabinet today. Um, I want to I want to maybe come back to that in John yeah. Adams case. Yeah, the, the disagreement in the cabinet. But but um, let's stick with Jefferson for a moment. OK. OK, so Jefferson, um, he quits. He comes back here, you know, you know heck with you people. And um, of course, none of us really believed that, that, mm -hmm. that he was quitting. Um, they didn't really believe it either. He didn't really believe it either, that he knew he was going to be mm -hmm. back. Um, but he proceeds to criticize Adams as a monocrat, mm -hmm. excessive executive power. He, he criticizes Hamilton. He quietly criticizes Washington, blames it on Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And yet, when Jefferson becomes president, mm. Um, he he's a powerful president. Mm -hmm. How does his experience in the cabinet affect Jefferson's understanding, President Jefferson's understanding of the executive? Yeah. So what's really interesting is when Jefferson was Secretary of State, even when he di really disagreed with Washington, he was very protective of executive power. And he was protective of it vis-a-vis -vis the Congress. He would go and testify in front of Congress about the need for executive power. And he was protective of it when it was threatened by visiting foreign uh, dignitaries or, or foreign ministers. So when, he, when Jefferson became president, he did a couple of things. First, that defense of executive power, which people sometimes forget how, how vocally he was in favor of the president having at least sort of unilateral control over foreign policy, but over other things too. He, and I give him a lot of credit for this, he sort of you know, had his ideas about what the republic should be. But then once he was in office, recognized what the presidency requires. And the presidency often does require a stronger executive that is willing to embrace executive power and use it. And of course, the Louisiana Purchase is the most famous example of his saying, OK, well, I'm just going to go ahead and do it, even if, you know, the Constitution isn't necessarily as clear about that. And, you know, he um, I. I can't remember if we were talking about this earlier, but he, you know, he had real reservations about how to go about doing the, the Louisiana Purchase, but felt that it was in the good of the nation, even if it wasn't particularly clear. And so I think that he was willing to embrace that use of the executive authority as laid out by Washington. He also shaped his own cabinet based on his experiences. He did not call a cabinet meeting unless he knew exactly what every single person was going to say. There was going to be no fighting. There's no no in disagreement. His in there was going to be no fighting. No, no, no. Um, he made sure he knew exactly what each person was going to say. If he felt there was going to be disagreement, he just did not bring up the subject. He would avoid it altogether. He did not permit cabinet meetings without his presence, which Washington had done a lot. And Jefferson had felt like that had given Hamilton way <laughs> too much leeway to cause trouble. And um, he was just really quite meticulous in shaping a cabinet experience that was very different from his own. And that was a direct reflection of how much he hated squabbling with Hamilton. Well, oddly enough, never mind chronology being the pusher of time, that, that's a good segue into Adams' cabinet. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I wanted, the other question I wanted to ask, Washington has a second cabinet. 
Yes. I mean, the first cabinet, Jefferson, Hamilton, All Knox, the luminaries. All these great, uh, Edmund Randolph. <laughs> And uh, it, it, near the end of his term, mm -hmm. Jefferson's gone back to one show, oh, Hamilton retires. Um, and he ends up with a less impressive cabinet. The B team. The B team, Timothy Pickering. I wish people would remember what Timothy Pickering did at, did at Lexington and Concord or didn't do. Uh, Oliver Wolcott, w William Bradford, James McHenry. And Adams inherits mm -hmm. this cabinet. And, and we say, well, that's ridiculous, but we can remember this is new. Yeah. I mean, the, the president, you know, Adams is the second president. What do you do with these cabinet officials? And they were, after all, George Washington's mm -hmm. cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, and so Adams is often viewed, and I know your new book is going to explain this to us, is often viewed as not having as successful a presidency as he might, or maybe an unsuccessful mm -hmm. presidency, in large part because of his cabinet. Mm -hmm. Is it Washington's fault? A little bit, yeah. Not all of it, but a little bit. So there, there were a couple of issues with the second cabinet. First of all, Washington didn't like them very much. Um, it was really hard to get people to take cabinet positions towards the end of his term, not because it, it was his administration, but because the positions were not very well paid. They were very arduous. You were gonna be away from your family for most of the year. Um, you, you know, Travel was really difficult at the time, so it's not like you could just hop on a plane for a weekend. And you were really opening yourself up to a lot of criticism if you took these positions. And so it became really difficult to get people into the administration. And so, for example, Washington asked at least six other people before finally settling on Timothy Pickering as the next Secretary of State. And Pickering knew it, which is not a great way to start a professional relationship. Um, but he was he was probably like the most difficult man alive in the 1790s and so a really bad choice for the temperament required of a of a sec you know a key diplomat um and james mchenry was the secretary of war and was apparently a lovely man but totally incapable of managing the office and so to your point when adams came into the presidency it's really important to remember he had never been in a cabinet meeting so he didn't know what they looked like he didn't know what kind of leadership was required what kind of management Washington had used. He had had perfectly fine relations with the cabinet that was currently existing, but he didn't know how bad they were at their jobs. And Washington <laughs> didn't tell him. And in fact, Washington encouraged them to take the job, which is befuddling to me. Um, I, to your point, he didn't wanna get rid of Washington secretaries because would that have been deemed judgment of Washington? Would that have led additional chaos to what was a very nerve wracking transition? He knew how hard it was to get people into these positions. Um, and they also, you know, Pickering had a lot of power in the Federalist Party and he didn't wanna cause any divisions. So he figured, all right, well, they were loyal to the office of the presidency under Washington, they'll be loyal to me, it's fine. Spoiler alert, it was not fine. Um, <laughs> Timothy Pickering was at times downright treasonous and uh, they were complete obstacle to his policies. They got away with behavior that would never be permitted today. Adams was initially sort of slow to learn of it. And then once he did learn of it, he really set about trying to set up obstacles to their treachery <laughs> is the best way to put it. Um, and eventually did clear them out and had his own cabinet, which must have been just like the most extraordinary relief to finally have John Marshall as Secretary of State, who was both competent and also not trying to undermine him at every turn. Um, so I do think, you know, his presidency might have gone differently if not for that cabinet. I think that he manages, one of my arguments is that his presidency has been really um, underappreciated and that there are, are real contributions and elements Everything from peace with France, which has lasted since 1800 uh, for the United States, to the creation of the first two elements of peaceful transfer of power. Those have been really underappreciated and are quite essential. So he gets a lot of really great stuff done, but he might have had a better time of it yeah. and enjoyed it a lot more if they were not in office. I would have to read the next book, but I, I, I think... Adam's cabinet does him in for the next yeah, election. I mean, he, totally. he wins only one term. Um, it, Lindsay and I could sit here all day having this conversation, but we, we definitely want to turn to your question. So be thinking of a question. Uh, I'll have one, one final question okay. for you. And, and if they don't have questions, I'll have a bunch of other questions <laughs> for you. Um, and and I, I ask this question with some trepidation. Okay. Lessons for today. Yeah, so there, I think there are a couple of really important ones. Um, so Washington 
established a precedent that the cabinet is very flexible. The cabinet is a reflection of what the president wants and needs. And I think the cabinet is the best way to understand an administration because it reveals their strengths, their weaknesses, what they care about, who has influence, all of those things. But Washington was quite meticulous in putting together his cabinet. We see, you know, this, well, this is actually not an accurate picture. It's just that there aren't that many pictures of the cabinet in, before photography, because that's John Adams, and John Adams was not in a cabinet meeting. But let's pretend this is an accurate picture. And um, we would see this, and we would say, well, that's a group of five white dudes. They saw it as actually a very diverse group. They came from different uh, geographic regions, different educational backgrounds, different experiences. They represented different economic and cultural interests. And at a time, again, back to this point of trying to build emotional connections to the nation, that was really important. And the best presidents since Washington, whether it's Lincoln or FDR or Theodore Roosevelt or Dwight Eisenhower, they have followed that model. They have recognized the opportunity that a cabinet provides to allow the American people to feel like their needs or interests are represented in the administration, to try and build a coalition, to try and build support. And it is supported by all of the social science that studies CEOs of nonprofits to Fortune 500 companies, that groups that bring different ideas together. So the opposite of yes men, you know, a group that has a lot of different perspective will avoid groupthink and tends to be much more profitable. And so Washington's example of surrounding himself with people who would tell him no, or tell him a lot of different ideas that he could pull from, is one that anyone in any position of authority, I think, can learn from. Okay, excellent. Um, why don't we turn to questions? Several, first of all, uh, we are live streaming this, so if you have a question, do wait for the microphone. And Susan, do we have surveys? We we'll check. Okay, so uh, but don't forget the surveys. But we anyone have a question for Lindsay? We have a question here. One second. Um, you've described the first three cabinets basically, mm -hmm. uh, but you also must have checked in with all the cabinets since. Okay, has there ever been a president at his first cabinet meeting who went around the room and said basically praise me? <laughs> That's a trick question. <laughs> it is a trick question. But it's a good question. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, in recent memory, that is that is so. There have been presidents who are more interested in flattery and praise than getting things done. Andrew Jackson is a really good example. Andrew Jackson went through three entire cabinets, basically forced everyone out until he found a group who would do whatever he wanted. Uh, and his first cabinet was 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 resisting, and so he basically didn't talk to them for a year until he engineered a way to kick them all out. So uh, we have had presidents who are less interested in soliciting good advice than others. Um, to my point that the good ones want to hear what they're doing wrong to rectify it. Okay. Other question? If, if I, I think hear. behind you. If not, I'm going to ask a very obscure question about Edmund Randolph. So we want your <laughs> questions. So, Lindy, as a public historian, so this is a little bit less about your book, but thinking about, you know, what role historic sites can serve as we approach the 250th mm -hmm. signing of the Declaration of Independence, what role do you see Monticello and other historic sites playing in that dialogue? You know, is it, is it new tours? Is it new articles? Mm -hmm. How do you see us? Yeah, oh, it's a great question. Accident. Thank you. And, and it's it's timely because um, a lot of us in the history field have spent the last week at a series of meetings talking about this exact question of recognizing that the anniversary of the Declaration is coming up. And that's a big opportunity. And when, you know, I think a lot of sort of average Americans aren't necessarily thinking about that anniversary, but at some point they will. And we want to be ready to bring them into the conversation. I think that the ideas of the Declaration can sometimes feel beautiful and glorious, but sort of intangible or, or nebulous or disconnected from our day-to-day -day lives. And so what I think of, especially for historic sites, I think the opportunity is to, and I, I always ground this in my own experience that I, I attribute my love of history to visiting historic sites when I was really, really little. 
because I think that when you're little, even if you love reading, which I did, it's a lot easier to envision what life looked like at a different time if you can see the space, whether it's Monticello or the tents at Jamestown or, you know, you name it. Um, it, it, it's a lot easier to envision what was different and what was the same when you see those spaces. And so I would love for historic sites to really lean into what was life like at that moment and what, like, how did, how did the news reach people? And we know that it did in different ways. We know that of course it was, it was transferred for newspapers, but we also know that then there was dialogue and conversation and it was shared word of mouth. There were readings of the declaration. And I would love for sites to explore what like the lived experience in that moment actually felt like. And I think that would make it feel a little bit more tangible for the average visitor. We were, um, Lindsay and I were talking about this actually just before the program started. And someone, I'm gonna throw out the phrase that I was so mm -hmm. enamored with this week. Uh, if the bicentennial was about patriotism, mm -hmm. the 250th needs to be about reflective patriotism. So it's not anti-patriotism, it's not not patriotism, but we have to think a little bit more complexly about some of the problems that were also occurring. Well, I think also because patriotism has kind of become a charged word, and it shouldn't be. Patriotism, patriotism doesn't belong to one group of people or one party or one section or one race or, or one gender. It, it should belong to all people. And um, I think the reflective component is thinking about what does it mean to you and how can you both be very proud and, and love your national identity and also want it to be better. I always go back to that James Baldwin quote, which is that I love America so much, I might be butchering it, but I love America so much that I want to criticize her to make her better, to make her a more perfect union, which I do actually really believe is the legacy of the, the founders and the fact that we've gotten away from the more perfect part is something I hope we can come back to. I see we have another question here. My question to do with the impact of military service on functionality of the cabinet. So oh. we know that a lot of our uh, veterans who were uh, building the country felt very strongly about executive power because they had to deal with the disarray of trying to supply an mm -hmm. army without, I don't know, a Congress. Um, and so as we had some members of the cabinet with military service and some without, um, mm -hmm. did you see a correlation between those who readily accepted the uh, nomenclature and the functionality of it mm -hmm. uh, and those who didn't, or was it irrelevant? Oh, I love this question. Thank you so much for asking it. So one of the really fascinating elements about the development of the, the federal government, but also the party system is not all Federalists were veterans, but almost all veterans were Federalists. And I think it's because they developed a sense of a national identity earlier in the army. They, they both saw parts of, you know, like most people did not leave their home state. It wasn't a regularly done thing. And if you were a part of the army, you were gonna go up and down the country depending on where the army sent you. And you were going to be with officers from other, other states. You were gonna be from tr with troops from other states. And you were, you were in the continental forces. You weren't in the Rhode Island forces or the Virginia forces. And so I think that it really did shape both their sense of national picture and, and national formation and what they wanted the nation to be. But also to your point, Congress was ridiculous during the war. Congress had a committee on committees because it was so ineffective and they were trying to figure out how to get it to work. And so they saw how difficult really dispersed authority could be for running a national project in a moment of crisis. And I think that a huge part of at least Hamilton and Jefferson's disagreement came from this military divide. Jefferson never served in the military. Hamilton did. It shaped his ideas of masculinity. It shaped his ideas about what a man should be. And I think that he, you know, I'm using modern words, but I think that sometimes he thought that Jefferson was a wimp. And um, it, you know, it absolutely colored their, their interactions. That, that flight from Monticello business didn't help. Correct. We have a question here. So we would look at that group of men and say five white men, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't. Do you know when that white term became so prevalent that we can't look at white people and say we're different? Mm -hmm. We're not just white? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know exactly in, um, in sort of in an American dialogue when that when that was a real shift in political discourse. 
my guess is if I had to make an educated guess, which again, this is speculation, but my guess is it would be after the Civil War when you started to have the Reconstruction and there was the introduction, especially in the South, of a lot of Black Republicans who were coming into government positions as civil rights and um, at least for a short period of time, public service was was made available to, to people who had previously been barred from that. Mm -hmm. The cabinet is really fascinating in terms of this particular question because it maps the inclusion of who counts as an American. And so first we see an expansion in terms of geographic representation. So Lincoln is the first president to have a secretary from a state west of the Mississippi which is obviously an important first step. You're starting to expand the boundaries of who is included in the nation. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt is the first to have a Jewish cabinet secretary. Of course, uh, FDR is the first to have a female cabinet secretary, and LBJ is the first to have a black cabinet secretary. So we start to see as civil rights are and, and uh, full citizenship is expanded to people, the cabinet tends to mark that as well. I mean, Lindsay uh, takes the question on uh, from a political perspective. There, of course, has been an enormous amount of work done on, on the realization of race more generically. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking mm -hmm. Gary Nash's Red, White, and Black mm -hmm. of, you know, when do Native Americans start seeing themselves as a different race? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we think of all these things as fixed, um, but it's really well, malleable. It is, and, and, you know, to that point, the Irish used to be considered yes. to be not, not white. And Italians were not white at a period, and Eastern Europeans were not white at a various moment. And so um, at various points, those those categories have shifted, and there's great scholarship on, on those as well. Yeah. I have a wonderful book about the Irish Rebellion in the 1790s. It was printed in the 18th century, and the pictures, all the Irish are very swarthy. Mm. They're very dark in those pictures. So, um, Other questions? We, we, back. Oh, please. Yeah, I'm wondering if you can say something more about the evolution of the confirmation, like the Senate confirmation mm -hmm. process and how that develops and how it changes over time with the rise of political parties, yeah. et cetera. Absolutely. So um, for most of American history, presidents have been given enormous latitude on, on at least on cabinet position nominations. So there have been cabinet secretaries that were rejected. Uh, they were relatively rare, and usually it was because there was concern that there was um, an ethical or especially a financial corruption. So there was a sense like if someone was nominated to be Secretary of the Treasury, if they had too many connections to, let's say, the railroad industry, then they could not be a fair Secretary of the Treasury. But those types of rejections were extraordinarily rare. And even people withdrawing their nominations, which is typically what happens now, if it seems like someone is gonna run into trouble, they tend to withdraw the nomination. That was extraordinarily rare. It started to increase more, the, the withdrawal of the nominations started to happen a little bit more in the 1980s and 1990s, but this is really a last, in the last 50 years. If that uh, phenomenon that we're talking about in terms of the really intense nomination confirmation processes, and um, I would actually suggest it is a, a one of many byproducts of weak political parties because weak political parties can protect moderation. They can protect their members from taking unpopular votes. They can protect a wider array of, of ideas. And um, when you have a, 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 I'm sorry, I was trying to say strong, strong parties do that. Gosh, I just totally butchered that. I point. was wondering about that. Strong for a parties, <laughs> strong parties protect moderation. Strong parties protect a lot of different perspectives. Weak parties tend to be controlled by the more extreme elements of the, the party and the faction. And um, that's when you start to get these super contentious battles. Wait a question here. I was going to go back to maybe your maybe your first point about uh, when Washington went to the Senate mm -hmm. and got nothing. Mm -hmm. um, if he had gone back, or if he had not lost his temper, mm -hmm. or if he had gotten good information, would his cabinet have been different? Would it have? Was that the point mm -hmm. where he knew, okay, I have to go someplace else because I'm not going to get it from here? Yeah, great question. So I think that certainly the cabinet might have developed in a different way. So 
as I said, the first cabinet meeting didn't happen until almost the very end of 1791. So that was a, a full year and a half, almost full, full two years after this, um, this meeting went very badly. So he, he was taking his time. He was very deliberate. He was exploring other options. Obviously, as the Senate expanded, no one wants to get advice from 100 senators. That would be preposterous. But I could see an alternate universe in which as the Senate expanded, maybe as we have today, we have a Council on Foreign Affairs. Um, maybe that council is what serves as the president's advisory body and the cabinet is really much more of a domestic advisory body. Uh, I'm advising on things that are occurring domestically within the executive departments. That is, that is a real possibility. And so instead of something like the National Security Council, which we saw sort of crop up to provide that, maybe it would be the Senate, who knows? Hard to, hard to say. We do want to stay on schedule, so maybe one more question, and you don't want it to be about Edmund Randolph. So <laughs> we can talk about question, Edmund Randolph, that's fine. <laughs> I want, it's, it's working? Good. It's working? Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask your opinion on the cabinet prior, or no, not prior, during Andrew Johnson's presidency mm. and Ulysses S. Grant's presidency, because those I know were some of the worst cabinets because they walked all over Andrew Johnson and then became pretty almost independent of Ulysses S. Grant. So I would, uh, I would, so I would agree with you that Andrew Johnson has one of the worst cabinets. I don't know that I would agree with Grant, and let me explain why. So Andrew Johnson. Um, was not the first president to inherit the office after his predecessor had died, but he was the first to inherit the office after uh, an assassination. And so he kept the cabinet, which presidents after have learned that that's a really bad idea. You don't want to keep your predecessor's cabinet. Um, he also happened to be a colossal jerk face. Like even by the standards <laughs> of the time, Andrew Johnson was a colossal jerk face. Tennessee, right? Yeah. Yeah, Tennessee. Yeah. I mean, he just like, even by the standards of the time, he was enormously racist. Like he was just, he showed up to his inauguration as vice president sloshed and was, you know, gave such a long speech that his predecessor basically had to like pull him by his coattails down to get him to stop talking. So he, you know, he was not, in, in no way was he a good president. He split with the cabinet very quickly over civil rights and reconstruction. And Congress was sympathetic to the cabinet. It was, uh, this is the reconstruction era. So Congress is passing the reconstruction amendments, is passing bills to protect civil rights. And they passed the Tenure of Office Act, which basically says that the president cannot fire a cabinet secretary without con congressional approval. Supreme Court, as a side note, in the 20th century said that that was yeah, unconstitutional. Can't, can't do that. But at the time, Johnson tested it and tried to get rid of Edwin Stanton. Now, um, that's what led to his impeachment. If your cabinet leads to your impeachment, never a good sign for cabinet management. <laughs> so, you know, on one hand, like I'm sympathetic to the cabinet because I think that their principles were were correct and what we would generally support today. Um, on the other hand, the cabinet is supposed to serve at the president's pleasure. So that is, you know, that is that bit of a conflict. Um, Grant gets a really bad rap with his cabinet because a lot of the history that was written about Grant and his cabinet was written, uh, it's called the Dunning School of History. It was written starting in the 1910s. Um, Dunning was a historian at Columbia. He said Reconstruction was terrible. He said that black voters should not have had the right to vote. They should not have been in office. And because Grant was protecting that, he was a terrible president. He also said Grant was drunk all the time and corrupt. There's not really any evidence of that. Now, where Grant's cabinet is interesting is Grant did give a ton of deference to his secretary of state, Hamilton Fish, one of the all-time great names for a cabinet secretary, by the way. Um, but they worked really closely. So like when, when Fish was trying to negotiate the Treaty of Washington with Great Britain, Fish would go every day, go to his sessions, do the negotiations, then go home. And Grant would go to Fish's home and discuss the day's deliberations and discuss what should happen the next day. So he did give him a lot of leeway, but there was actually a lot more management than I think is appreciated. And where I think Grant ran into trouble was his, one of his private secretaries was really pretty corrupt. And Grant was very loyal to him for probably longer than he should have been before eventually accepting his resignation because they had been together in the war. <laughs>
So I think Grant is actually, I, I think he's one of the more underrated presidents, presidents. I think that he tends to get a bad rap for a lot of the corruption that was across the entire system at the time. It's what's called the spoil system. And he tried to reform it and Congress refused. So um, Johnson, worst cabinet, maybe ever, but certainly bottom three. Grant, I would put a little bit higher. Uh, you know, next book, uh, Military Experience of the Presidents and How It Affects the Presidency. Washington, oh, Jackson, yeah. Grant, Eisenhower. Very That's certainly an option. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> it's important to get Lindsay ideas. Uh, well, we do want you to have an opportunity to go buy a book, and Lindsay would be happy to sign it over in the shop, but let us begin. Thank you. I also... Um, Happy to discuss this and hand these out over there, but I, if anyone is interested, I have these, which is the cover of a new one, and on the back there's the ordering information if anyone would like one. So <laughs> right. always have to do that just to make sure I'm covering my bases. Thank you all so Thank much for being so here. Much. I hope to have a, a chance to chat with you across the street.